a dear friend, Dr. Sinead Walsh, and also Oliver Johnson, who I know from Sierra Leone. We're so thrilled to have you both here. Uh, currently, Sinead is the U EU ambassador to South Sudan. Um, prior to this, she served as ambassador of Ireland to Sierra Leone and Liberia and head of Irish aid um, in both of these countries while based in Freetown um, from 2011 to 2016. And Dr. Oliver Johnson is a visiting lecturer in global health at King's College London. He was based in Freetown from 2013 to 2015, working as the director of the King's Sierra Leone Partnership. And we're just delighted to have them here. In our sponsored research uh, program uh, at, under GRIT, we also talk about policy issues. And so not just research and generating research in low resource settings, but how do you then translate that into action? And I think this is going to be a fabulous discussion today. So I'll turn it over to the two of you. Welcome. Great. Uh, good morning, everybody, um, and everybody who's remote as well, especially in my beloved Freetown uh, and Monrovia. Um, it's great to be here. Um, um, just to, to, to maybe uh, give you a bit of context. Uh, oh, you're doing fine, okay. Um, we, you can do them all. Oliver and I, uh, very efficient, uh, very efficient slides there. Oliver and I were in, um, Sierra Leone before the, the outbreak doing completely different things and having, you know, no, no uh, inkling whatsoever that we would end up working on an Ebola crisis. Uh, so uh, Oliver was working on health systems uh, strengthening um, and, and as Jesus said, I was, I was uh, I'm the head of the Irish Aid Program, so working on, you know, a wide range of, of education. Uh, it's actually a, a team pregnancy program, which we have talked about before, uh, uh, a teen pregnancy prevention program um, and nutrition and, and a wide range of things. Um, but basically, uh, something happened um, in, 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 actually in December of 2013, uh, in that red dot there, um, uh, an 18 month old uh, baby, uh, we now, we now uh, um, know uh, or, or the, the, the theory is that uh, he, uh, his name was Emil Wamuano, uh, that he played in a tree near his house where bats were, um, you know, were sort of hanging around, um, and that he must have had some kind of contact with, with bat feces, and, and this caused the first uh, Ebola outbreak in West Africa. But because we'd never had an Ebola outbreak in West Africa before, it actually took um, three months to to diagnose. So, um, you know, uh, you know, sort of a, an eighteen-month-old child dying in, the, in a village, in a remote village in Guinea, was not particularly, uh, unfortunately, remarkable uh, in any way, and it took quite a long time. And Oliver and I were in um, in Sierra Leone, um, and we had basically. From March of 2014, we kind of knew that uh, Ebola was was nearby um, because, as you can see, that area, that village, and, and probably it's you know quite close to this sort of fairly major town of Guecadu, um, where his village was, is very very close to both uh, Sierra Leone and Liberia borders, and indeed, you know, the same group actually for hundreds of years have lived across the borders and. and them back and forth every day for shopping and for, for, for family life and so on. Um, so we knew that we were vulnerable, but um, we were actually so preoccupied with so many other issues in, in Sierra Leone and, and those of you who, who work with Teresa and other programs in, in Sierra Leone will know there's lots of other things to, uh, you know, to, to be concerned about. So in 2014, I mean, I remember very clearly sort of, you know, sitting in, in meetings in the spring of 2014 about, uh, about the food security problems, about the economy tanking, about all the corruption problems, the problems in basic services, and knowing that this, you know, Ebola, uh, um, you know, epidemic was going on in Guinea, but just really, really hoping that we could dodge the bullet in, in Sierra Leone. I mean, just to give you one example from Freetown, 70% uh, of, of Freetown in self informal settlements um, and this is one uh, one photo of a slum in in Freetown itself so just to give you an idea of the scale of some of the challenges around sanitation and and you know just just try to imagine uh, this kind of environment then uh, with an infectious disease uh, crisis um, so 
so yes, I was really hoping we could dodge, dodge the bullet uh, because we had so many um, other issues going on, but alas, we could not. So I'll just pick up a bit here. Um, so I, as background, I trained as a doctor, but I never practiced, I never did my internship. Uh, I was teaching at King's Global Health, uh, and then I went out to uh, lead a health system strengthening partnership between King's and the main hospital, Connaught in Freetown, the main medical school, Comas. Um, and there was a little team, three of us, on the ground at the time, tiny little bits of funding. Um, and then we got this news flash sitting in, the, in our office, was next to the medical superintendent of the hospital, sitting one day at our laptop, got this news flash that there um, had been this undiagnosed uh, outbreak in Guinea. Um, and then got a phone call from the minister saying, look, we'd like you to join a national task force we're setting up. And we thought, well, we, you know, what are we, we don't, we're not humanitarians, we're not doing clinical work, we're doing health systems work, but we've been asked to go along. Uh, and initially thought we had very little contribution to make. Um, now just as a sort of background, I'll you know a little bit about Ebola, how it spread, which isn't airborne, it spread through blood and diarrhea and, and, and um, body fluids, so particularly spread uh, in health facilities um, because that's where sick people are and where health workers can very easily get infected. Um, and some of the, the pillars of an outbreak response, so the sorts of things that you would expect at that stage of an outbreak response would be things like case management, so the clinical care of patients who are sick, surveillance, tracking where the patients go, uh, a focus on burials, um, and we don't know how much uh, burials were a cause of spreading the disease, but what we do know uh, is that dead bodies can be contagious uh, and that burial practices often involved a lot of physical contact, washing of bodies, contact with bodies at funerals, uh, and is a potential route to spread. Uh, and also, obviously, the importance of social mobilization. So we knew those are the sorts of things that an outbreak response used to have. But in those early days, we'd go along to task force meetings um, in a, a round a table, a bit like this, a bit bigger, uh, in the UE building where the Ministry of Health is, and you had the UN there and a few NGOs there and the ministry there. But the reality was there was a lot of planning on paper, um, but they had very little, uh, brought a very little reality what was going on the ground in a hospital like this at Connaught. So, for example, um, there was a, a case management group set up led by the ministry to prepare guidelines for every hospital to get prepared. Because we had a couple of months where we knew it was in Guinea, and the first case hadn't been diagnosed in Sierra Leone, we had a couple of months warning to get ready. Um, but even after writing these guidelines, the reality was that we couldn't get a list from the ministry of all the hospitals in the country. So even working out well, what are the hospitals, not even the clinics or the pharmacies, the hospitals, who should we send them to at the hospital, getting contact details. We got an email address. Do rural hospitals have internet access? If they do, do they have a functioning printer to print them? So even the physical act of getting these guidelines out to rural hospitals, in the end, we had to call up our friends in different NGOs uh, and say, look, can you just print these at your office? get in the car as a favor to us, unfunded, and drive them down and just, you know. So even physically getting the guidelines out of the ministry into the field is a challenge, let alone then implementing those guidelines, which required specialist, um, you know, uh, personal equipment, but those were in very short supply. It required funding for little bits of infrastructure work. It required training, but all the training was in rooms like this. So health workers were trained by PowerPoint, how to wear these suits. Um, and the idea was, well, we'll train one doctor and one nurse at every hospital, and then they'll go up and, and somehow magically train all of their colleagues without a projector to show slides, without any equipment. So the reality was that we, a lot was happening on paper, but very little was happening in, in real life. And I think that was one very important kind of policy to practice uh, thing. The other thing to know is there was so much uncertainty. Was Ebola airborne? We didn't think so. But that's not terribly reassuring when you're a physician uh, what was the fatality rate? We thought 80%, uh, 50 to 80%. Uh, what was the best treatment? We didn't really know. What was spreading the infection? How many cases were there? Were there? It's the other really important point was the uncertainty we were dealing with at the time. So my role, uh, we were asked by, as well as doing the national work by Connaught Hospital in Freetown, they said to us, could Kings help us to set up an Ebola unit? And initially this room here, which was in the emergency department, um, is where we set up a two-bedded isolation unit. Because the idea was, Ebola doesn't cause big urban outbreaks, which seems ridiculous now, but at the time, the belief was it causes small rural outbreaks in villages, but for some reason it burns out too quickly, whatever reason, it doesn't come to big cities. So all of the ID specialists, you know, I, went, I remember meeting someone in London who was a leading ID specialist, and he said, we don't know why, it just doesn't cause big urban outbreaks, so that's not what you need to prepare for. You just need to prepare for one or two cases that might come in from a rural village, 
and end up at your hospital. So we had a two-bedded unit, a couple of cholera beds, and I remember the day where we had one patient, which was about sort of June, July uh, 2014, a few months into the outbreak, we had one patient uh, who was a suspected case, um, and then we had a second about two hours later, uh, and I began to think, wow, we've used up both our beds. And then we had a third call from A&E saying we've got a patient here, and we realized that in that moment we had massively underestimated what was coming. And that evening, the medical superintendent, the matron, the maintenance department, we got together, we put together, uh, we closed half of the emergency department and turned it into a Ebola unit. But you can see the reality of an Ebola unit is nothing that is mystified. But the reality was we needed plastic sheeting. We went to the market, we bought plastic sheeting, we bought plastic buckets, some chlorine, uh, we put up some fans for patients. But this was the reality of some the plastic buckets. This was the reality of what an Ebola looked like. What we didn't know at that time that this room, which initially had, well, six, nine beds, ultimately we managed to squeeze 20 beds into this area, saw over a thousand patients, of which more than 750 tested Ebola positive. So that was uh, about twice as many Ebola patients as the total number in the largest previous outbreak in the world we saw in this room. Um, and so it also kind of shows how much this was happening at a different scale to what we were used to. Um, and then as sort of July moved into August, uh, as Monrovia, we, got, we heard of kind of Monrovia being overwhelmed, uh, we began to realize that, that it was really Armageddon on the ground in Sierra Leone. Uh, flights started canceling, NGOs and other partners started pulling out. Uh, the international media was starting to tell these kind of horror stories. Uh, a lot of my colleagues started to get sick and die, including the national head of the Ebola response, Sheikh Omar Khan, who was the person I would call when we had a patient for advice he died. Then Dr. Mujipe Cole, who was a, a good friend and colleague who was the head of this unit, because we were just supporting, he himself also got sick and died of Ebola. So then we faced the reality of, of health workers beginning very understandably being uh, kind of very alarmed about their own safety. Um, and so at the end of September, um, to put this in perspective, uh, this is a, a whiteboard, the number of available beds uh, in the country at that time. And we had hundreds of patients in their homes who, had had, who were sick, who were pretty sure had Ebola. Um, and yet the reality was that we had no beds available. So I show this slide partly to show six months into this outbreak, how little capacity, how little there really was in the response at that time, but also just to talk about the importance of coordination. So um, <coughs> when our unit at Connaught became full, uh, we decided that we had, we had so many patients coming in and then collapsing outside the unit in the hallways, vomiting, so many of my, my colleagues who were nurses, cleaners, doctors were getting sick. We decided we had to close the gates of the hospital and we couldn't allow someone with a fever into the hospital unless we had a bed to isolate them in, because otherwise where would we put them? So we had more and more patients collapsed outside the hospital. We built tents outside the hospital for them to wait in until beds became available. And then I went up to the military hospital and I found it was half empty because there was no mechanism for making, working out where are their beds, where are their ambulances. So simple things like let's have a whiteboard Let's have someone phone them up each morning. Let's make the most of the resources we have. Coordination that was also really short supply. And I just mentioned this colleague, Amar. So Amar was, uh, had studied film studies in London. She'd gone on to manage Wicked the Musical uh, in, in London. She decided to take a year off, off to work as a teacher, volunteer teacher in Sierra Leone. Started going house to house uh, to raise awareness of the new Ebola response. And then I said to her, look, you know, your skills managing West, uh, Wicked, the musical, actually very relevant to managing an ambulance service around building a team, coordination. We had some fantastic Sierra Leonean medical students who worked alongside her because medical schools were closed. And all sorts of people started to turn up and play really important roles in the response who weren't necessarily from backgrounds you expected. And that was kind of another lesson from us, uh, is that some of these skills are transferable. So I'll hand back to uh, Sinead at this point. Great. Um... So yeah, meanwhile, um, it's his arrows, is it? It's all space for. Um, great. I mean, so, so meanwhile, um, I was uh, traveling around the, the country trying to, um, trying to raise the alarm, uh, both, both nationally and internationally, of, of what people like Oliver were saying from you know, the, the, the clinics. Um, and it was extraordinary how difficult this was, um, you know, given what we were seeing, um, you know, it was extraordinarily difficult even, even uh, to, to really get the national government to see how serious this was. So for quite a long time in the summer of 2014, the national government, uh, Ministry of Health and uh, the World Health Organization, who would be the sort of main international actor in these sorts of situations, were basically saying, you know, it's under control. 
and we were saying it's not under control. Um, and I remember one particular um, uh, meeting, we had, we had this presidential task force. So initially we, we tried, it, it took quite a while uh, you know, for us to really get President Corona to engage personally uh, in the response. And then when he did, he, he set up uh, this presidential task force. And I remember sitting in one of the meetings and the Minister for Health at the time, uh, um, who Theresa will know very well, you know, stood up and, and, and gave a speech about how, you know, things, you know, what was happening and how they were getting equipment and the health workers being trained and the kind of things that Oliver has spoken about and basically concluded by saying, you know, so it's under control uh, and so on. And then I was to speak uh, on behalf of the international community and I had a totally different set of, of you know, talking points. And so, I, you know, because basically, you know, the NGOs were, were calling me off where I was going around to visit uh, places and just seeing that, you know, the kind of horror and the health workers dying and the patients at the gates and, and no beds and so on. And so I was like, well, I'm just going to have to say what I had planned to say, even though it was very much the opposite of, of what the minister had just said. So, yeah, I didn't necessarily make all that many friends uh, at the time. <laughs> But, but basically, uh, uh, in fact, one, one person who's apparently a friend of mine um, uh, termed me harasser in chief uh, at this time, uh, which I, I was supposed to take as a compliment. But, um, but, but basically, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was very difficult at the national level and it was also very difficult at the international level because it also felt like the world was, was just sort of asleep uh, to all of this um, and that we really couldn't get the messages across. Um, and, um, you know, we, we had um, this just really sort of surreal few months where um, we felt like we were all sort of talking into, you know, the wind uh, and that our words were just not reaching anywhere. Um, uh, but ultimately, um, we did end up in a situation where in September of 2014, partly because, uh, I mean, it certainly felt to us at the time, like uh, there was, you know, kind of, if you remember, you know, an American doctor got infected in Liberia in late July, Ebola went almost, in fact, that same week, Ebola went to Nigeria, and this, you know, sort of preoccupied the Western world quite a lot more than, than it had when it was sort of only in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. Um, and so, you know, certainly partly because of those sorts of, you know, per, you know perceived increased threats to the Western world, by September, um, in September, we started seeing a lot more attention. And in fact, uh, this, this woman in the middle, who you may recognize, uh, Samantha Power um, and Barack Obama, um, personally, you know, got on the phone, they were chairing the Security Council at the time and called a whole load of uh, world leaders um, and, and people like Jim Kim from the World Bank were very active. So eventually in September, you know, there was a sort of big, uh, big session at the UN um, and for the first time in, in, in their history, the president of MSF, Joanne Liu, called for military intervention, um, which, you know, shocked everybody. Um, but basically what she was saying was, the clinical scale of this is so vast at this point, it's so uncontrollable that we think the only thing that will work is like military doctors and nurses en masse. Um, now we didn't get that, uh, but we did get the military. Uh, we got, we got uh, 3,000 US military initially in Liberia, and then the British, uh, British sent military also to, to, to Sierra Leone, but they didn't, uh, they didn't do uh, treatment. Um, you know, partly because uh, of, of they thought it was, was too risky, uh, which, you know, um, is, is a whole other conversation. Um, so, so the treatment remained in, in the hands of, of NGOs like, like Oliver's and, and MSF and so on. Uh, but, there, but there was a huge, a huge international um, surge that came in after September and eventually by, uh, I mean, it took, it took another 12 months in, in Syria, probably not you probably didn't see it in the media for that long if you were outside the country, but, but it took another 12 months for, for Sierra Leone after that international surge for us to actually um, get to zero. Um, and it was in that sort of uh, time when things were winding down um, that Oliver and I ran into each other um, of all places on the beach uh, outside of Freetown called Toke, which maybe you will know well, some of you. Um, and we, you know, things at that point, it wasn't 
by the Giro, but things were sort of, you know, going very well, it was very much heading in that direction. Um, and, and, and Oliver and I just ran into each other by accident and we had worked a little bit together during the response. He, he would have occasionally, uh, you know, sort of raised an issue for me to, to try to help with in terms of the politics. Uh, we gave them a little bit of funding at some point, uh, but we didn't have a huge amount of interaction. Um, and then we just really accidentally met this one day on the beach and, and ended up talking for four hours about how, how frustrated we were to see that now that things were getting better, there was a lot of self-congratulations going on. There was a lot of back clapping going on and everybody sort of saying, oh, we did it, you know, we got there in the end. And, and we were sort of, I suppose, a couple of the few internationals who'd been there from the beginning. And we were, you know, not so much, you know, thinking about the positive congratulations, but thinking of everybody that hadn't been saved and thinking of the thousands of lives that had been lost unnecessarily. We firmly believed that it was it was largely avoidable. Um, and so we had a much harder time with all the congratulations and you know, the sort of notion that, well, if you get there in the end, you can almost forget about sort of, you know, how long it took you or how many lives that it cost to get there, you know, that somehow you just, it's okay if you just get there in the end. So, so we, we were, I suppose, feeling uh, a lot more, you know, despondent and also angry, uh, I would say. Um, and, and that was basically how the, the, um, the, the idea for the book first came up because we thought, well, you know, we, we, it, since, since we have this uh, perspective and we have this sort of full response perspective, um, you know, we should actually, we should tell, we should tell people, we should document this. And also, not just the mistakes, um, but including, you know, including the mistakes because we wanted to chip in on some level to, to, to something like this not happening at, again, but also we wanted to, um, you know, very much talk about the heroes that we had worked um, with and alongside, some of whom did not survive. Uh, some of whom did survive, but wouldn't be able to, for various reasons, to sort of frankly kind of write down what had happened. Maybe they lose their jobs or, or, or whatever. Um, and so we thought, well, we can, we can interview, uh, you know, all, the, all those people and, and we, can, we can document this. So this is really what, um, you know, what led to, to the book, you know, was this feeling very much that, you know, uh, you know, many people have died, many more people than are recorded because, of course, there was a lot of people in the early days who, who didn't ever make it into the data. So we know that, you know, when we say 3,956 people in Sierra Leone, we know that that's very partial. Um, and also because that doesn't count the secondary deaths. So that doesn't count the people who died of, you know, malaria or the people who died in childbirth because they weren't able to go to a clinic because their clinic was closed or their health worker had died and so on. And we know now from the statistics that that number is more than the people who died directly of Ebola. And so these are, these are some of the issues that we wanted to highlight. Um, so just to, just to finish up, because we, we want to spend some time um, uh, discussing with, with yourselves and answering your question. Really briefly, we had these five, five lessons um, that, that came out of, of the book. And the first and by far the most important is community engagement. Um, and this, is, this was our biggest failure in the response, our failure to respectfully and empathetically you know, <clears throat> level with people and really you know, assist them to understand a disease they had never encountered before and assist them to, uh, you know, to actually overcome it. Rather, what we did do most of the time is just what you see in this picture, we came along with a poster, we came along with a megaphone and we said, you should A, B, C, D and people, you know, understandably, and there were all sorts of, you know, conspiracy theories as well, in terms of what was really going on, and this was all very strange to people, and they just saw people going into these clinics, and then most people never came out again, and yet we didn't really, we really underestimated how important this area was, and how much investment it really needed, and we tended to focus much more on the the clinical side, even though we also didn't focus enough on that for a long time. Um, so this is our, our, our sort of number one, uh, number one lesson. And, and we try to talk in the book about how we did it wrong, but then also finally some of the good, uh, the good practices that eventually did, did come out and help people sort of own, own what was going on and, and, and support them to take the actions that, that they thought was appropriate within their context. Um, the second point then is about leadership and coordination. Um, 
you know, Oliver's talked about, about coordination and, and how important that was. And you might remember this moment when, when Barack Obama hugged uh, Nina Pham, the nurse from, from Dallas, uh, who was a survivor. And that was a very powerful message, I think, around, around stigma. Um, but really, we, we found that, you know, the leadership from, from the national government, from the World Health Organization and the international community, at, uh, you know, at large, was way, way, way too weak uh, in those early months, and that, that was really, really key. And then we did see a shift in that. We did see much better leadership eventually, and often from quite unexpected quarters. The Sierra Leone military, by far, we would say, were the, the, the national institution that stood up the best uh, on Ebola, and we would not have expected that necessarily. So, you know, uh, they did incredible work and, and, and their clinicians uh, really saved a lot of lives. Um, so some of the leaders that came up eventually weren't the ones that, you know, were maybe in those formal positions. Um, and then we, we, you know, so we look at, we look at why that was. Um, so we look at both, both when leadership went wrong and then eventually when it went, when it went right. Um, and, and that is very connected to this point, uh, which is about, you know, the, the politicization of the response and, and all the issues around corruption and so on. And this is something that we, we felt very strongly about because, you know, these issues are often quite taboo, maybe particularly when Western, I don't know if it's, you know, Western people writing about Africa and they think, oh, well, you know, I shouldn't talk about that, that's none of my business. I don't really understand that because I'm a diplomat, so my whole life's politics, so I have absolutely no problem talking about politics and corruption. And the reality is that for Oliver and I, this dominated uh, so much of, of our and other people's experience of the response, you know, people trying to politicize it, both nationally and internationally, by the way, people trying to use it for political gain, financial gain, and so on. So we try to, to really expose that in, in the book and, and then look at look at ways in which, you know, uh, other people, um, you know, came in and tried to make it better in the last year. Yeah, so one which was very important for me was about this idea of wherever possible working through government systems. And um, Sinead has pointed out to me that it's not always possible. So in some situations, like in a conflict zone, the government is part of the conflict <laughs> uh, and therefore it's necessary to have some independence. But this was not the case in West Africa. And yet the default for many humanitarian agencies was to find an empty field uh, and to do something completely independently. Uh, and the truth was that, first of all, that took a very long time. So this is Kerry Town. This was the crown jewel of the British response, so to speak, built, designed uh, by the uh, uh, Royal Engineers in the British Army, run by Save the Children, uh, cost 80 million pounds, uh, and, and took four months to build. So whilst these you know, uh, patients were in a tent outside my unit, which I opened in four hours on a, on a Wednesday night, we spent four months building this thing because we had to cut out uh, trees out of the jungle, we had to put in roads, set sewage for the flooding, electricity, uh, you know, build new teams of health workers. So it takes a very long time uh, to do things separately. It's very expensive. By comparison, this is a unit that we built. We got a phone call. It's in a local clinic called Macaulay Street in Freetown. We got a phone call on a Sunday from the medical superintendent saying, uh, we'd like Kings to help us open a unit. We went down that day, started construction that day. We admitted our first patients uh, just over a week later. So it was possible to move much more quickly if you work with government systems. Obviously, government partners, you know, Sierra Leonean colleagues have much better relationships with the local community. But finally, it's also about the fact that uh, Ebola is going to come back. Ebola exists in the bat population, the animal population in Sierra Leone. Sooner or later, there will be another kid playing under a tree. Uh, this tent, a year later, a BBC journalist called Tum Mazunga went there and she said that this, this 80 million pound centre was occupied only by goats. Because, of course, how are you going to maintain this tented city in the jungle, uh, or a jungle, but in the, you know, outside of the city? And whereas what we did is we used humanitarian funding to build a permanent center for infectious diseases at the main hospital that can isolate any infectious disease. There's a training site for Sierra Leonean doctors that is part of the hospital. So using the response to build a permanent legacy led by Sierra Leonean national colleagues uh, should be our kind of priority and response. The other thing is talk about the importance of individuals. Uh, this is someone called Yvonne Akisoya. So Yvonne, someone we both know well, she was a businesswoman in London uh, from the Sierra Leone diaspora community during the response. She wanted to support the response. So she got on a plane and she turned up at the National Ebola Response Centre and said, I want, I want to help. And she was given a, a role as National Director of uh, Planning for the response. She played a very key role in, in bringing the response to a close. Some of those improvements that Sinead mentioned in community engagement because of her uh, she then helped lead the recovery from Ebola and earlier this year was elected mayor of Freetown. 
Uh, so she's someone who's now uh, leading work to um, improve sanitation, housing, and other things in the city. And it's people like Yvonne, uh, people in the Sierra Leone military, uh, who really stepped up and made a difference. And so it's kind of a lesson in, it's not all multi-agency, uh, CDC, you know, UNICEF, but sometimes individuals you need to work with and capture, and it's sometimes hopefully inspiring to other people about the roles they could play uh, in these responses. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that Yvonne uh, has read the book and supports the book, uh, and because it was very important to us that it's not just in Boston and London that we have these conversations, but it's also in, in Freetown and in Monrovia, and with the books for sale in, in Sierra Leone, and we um, we'll be going out there to do a launch soon and, and to continue these conversations. So I guess at that point we wanted to wrap up and then open it to a, a bit of discussion and debate. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We've got enough time for discussion, so I'd like to open it up for questions, comments for our audience and also our online participants. So let us know if you uh, have a comment or question online as well. How about in the room first? Thank you. Um, this is fascinating to, to hear your experiences. And uh, I'm curious about the, the need for um, coordination and, and getting the government actors and the NGOs to work together. And the funding structures typically work against that, right? Because wow. they're mostly vertically oriented. Uh, and now that the crisis has passed, what, what's your experience of funding being available to do this health system strengthening, which is kind of critical to prevent a future uh, outbreak from happening. I think, I think Theresa might also have some thoughts on that because we were talking about it yesterday. But yeah. I mean, I think there's, a, there's this kind of three parts to that question for me. So uh, one of the things, uh, one of the points someone made earlier in the week, I think, from you is that Bola was spread by love. It was spread because people loved their children who were sick or their family members, um, but also a Bola response was built on trust. And there was a lack of trust undermining this. There was a lack of trust between the international donors um, um, between the international donors and the government. So, you know, donors were unwilling to hand over money to the government. The government within ministry, people that we interviewed over at World Today, mostly interviewed over 80 people for the book. And some of the people said to us, even when we had money, we were unwilling to sign off on things because we were worried we were going to be held accountable for how it was spent in future investigations. There wasn't trust between health workers and the government because they were worried they weren't going to get paid as promised or they weren't going to get medical treatment. So there was, and then of course the communities and the public didn't trust any of these people. And um, so trust was a huge issue and that played into the willingness of donors to give money to the government for their response. Um, but another reality for us, so early on in that outbreak, when, I, when we saw that the paper policies were not being translated into practice, uh, we asked for $12,000 as Kings from Bibi uh, to build about a half dozen Ebola units in Freetown and provide on the ground training to bring out two inspectors to these specialists from the UK. All we needed was $12,000. Bear in mind the whole response in Sierra Leone cost, what, a billion? More than a billion? Well, a billion. But over a billion total, we just wanted $12,000. Tim was, we can't do 12, we can't do $12,000. That's too small an amount of money for us to even know how to get out. We wouldn't even know how to give you that much money. And, and this time frame isn't right for us. Um, go speak to someone else. So there was an early problem with donors getting money, small amounts of money rapidly to people on the ground who needed it because the uh, bureaucracy uh, and the fact there's one different health advisor for multi-million pound programs uh, and their capacity to deliver, you know, and the Irish Aid is one of the few agencies that does have a capacity to come out some small amounts of money, but as a general issue, that was one. Uh, uh, but the other issue is that absolutely. So during the outbreak, we, you know, donors and ministry were all hand-wringing and saying, this is because of the weak health system, we mustn't make the same mistakes again, we're going to build back better, there's going to be a Marshall Plan for health system strengthening in Africa, and then, you know, and, and Difford said to us, you know, Difford would at this point started funding Kings, uh, you know, quite a lot, and I said, I know when this outbreak ends, my Difford funding will stop, and they said, no, no, we're going to be with Kings for the long term, we're going to continue funding the health system strengthening work, the reality was that we immediately did go back to business as usual, we continue to do vertical funding, um, we continue not to do the, you know, yes, sometimes vertical programs around malaria and HIV are useful, but if they're built on the fact that there isn't strong funding for the undergraduate training of doctors and nurses, there isn't support for a supply chain to get drugs from the warehouse into the field without drugs going missing. Um, and I think what we've seen is the shift from the health system strength to global health security. And global health security is a phrase that makes me really uncomfortable because it's basically, how do we protect ourselves from you? 
how do we protect ourselves from Sierra Leone rather than saying, and you know, the last line of the book um, is basically about questioning whether we as an international community value African lives and think all lives are equal. But global health security is really about saying, how can I put in the minimal infrastructure necessary to protect myself from any other, other, other Ebola's rather than saying, how do we support you to build your health systems uh, to the strength they need? So I think that's one of the um, key failures to learn the lesson from the response is that I don't think we're putting any of the, the groundwork we need in um, for those sorts of things. No, I mean, just to say, I, I um, kind of separately to this, I, I was chairing the, the, um, the donor group for the Liberia Health Center Pool Fund for, for five years, uh, my sort of five years in the region. And, um, and it was both the hardest and one of the most worthwhile things I've ever worked on because it was all this really messy stuff around, you know, how do you pay health workers and how do you pay health workers in remote areas and how do you get the drugs out of the warehouse and to the clinics without, you know, the siphoning and, and you know, the, the, the unsexy, backroom, boring, really, really difficult and, and you know, highly often politicized uh, work. Um, and I, I did find in that experience that there was a reluctance among a lot of other donors to really get their hands dirty with that kind of work. And then yet we would want to come in and do a nice malaria program or a nice HIV and, and, and work in this vertical way. Um, and as Oliver said, I mean, we don't really have the impression, I think, I mean, there's definitely some positive things which have happened after the outbreak, um, but we don't really have the impression that that sort of fundamental generational commitment that is needed to, to, to health system strengthening is really there. But I know, Teresa, you've had a bit more of a positive experience on the research side. Yeah, I mean, it's mixed. I mean, so Tom and I have a study that Tom's leading that will launch soon, um, funded by the National Institutes of Child Health and Development, uh, where we'll be tracking the lives of Ebola-affected kids. So kids who were infected, kids who were affected because of losing a family member, a family member sick, and then a comparison group of kids in the pediatric population not at all affected. And the idea is to follow the same longitudinal sort of course that we did with our child soldier study. And in doing this, um, another uh, NIH grant we have is our U19 grant, which is on mental health services research, taking evidence-based mental health programs to scale for youth employment programs. So we've been able to argue for the need for research and, and the innovative nature of being able to contribute to evidence-based practices, or in the case of the Ebola-affected kids, understanding mechanisms um, that could be targets for interventions. Uh, and with this funding, there's capacity building. So I will say that, and I don't know if our colleagues in Sierra Leone are on the line, but certainly there are some very bright, wonderful, there's new talent that has come to Sierra Leone, possibly through some of these capacity building initiatives, uh, where before when we tried to find anyone um, who was interested in our topics, child development, global mental health, uh, implementation science, we didn't, there were people who were doing like sociology or, you know, broad based things that weren't so applied. So as public health, mental health, social work, we weren't finding it. And now we have some amazing collaborators. So Dr. Haja Wuri, um, who's our um, key counterpart um, at the University of Sierra Leone. She's got trainees. We have Stephen Savali, who's one of two psychiatrists in the country. Um, Dr. Jalo, who's with the Ministry of Health. They're much more, um, nimble and thinking about research and eager to get involved. I think what's happening in capacity building though, and I had a meeting at the US ambassador's office, is a lot of us outside groups, you may see this Oliver, are getting capacity building funds. But again, if the pipeline's not there to make more <coughs> doctor worries come into the pipeline, and it's still, there's, I haven't seen a rigorous pipeline um, initiative. What's happening is we're all getting funded to build a capacity of the same five people. Yeah. You're funded, you're funded, he's funded, she's funded, and we're funded. Exactly one of those fundamental long-term, yeah. you know, really expensive things that, right. that, that we tend to sort of. Uh, yeah, I mean, just avoid. two comments on that. So one is uh, I was at, uh, with a colleague from IRC earlier this week who was saying that they were really delighted they just won a different grant around maternal health in Sierra Leone, and it's as long as 22 months, I think. And, she, and I was saying, how are you going to do it in 22 months? She said, no, that's long. That's long compared to what it could be. But how, you know, by the time you've 
got your team in place. You know? yeah. And the other thing they say is, well, health system strengthening has to be national program. So whoever bids for this has to be able to have a reach into every single clinic and hospital in the country. But the reality is that to, to, to have the depth of relationship in each of one of these complex facilities is not for, so people just come and they tick, you know, end up tick box programs. Yeah. So I think there's a length of time issue. And, and one of the things I'm interested in is, well, why did the Syrian army step up in a different way? And, and you know, Stephen Sevely, as you just mentioned, one of the great, great guys, he's, a, he's from the army. Yeah, um, and now he's the medical director for the army. Oh, is he? Yeah, okay, great. so it's a great role for um, him, but they were very organized. And, were and part of it is because the international support for the military has looked very differently to what we've done in health system. So, the British, American, other militaries who have partnered with the Syrian military, that the army was completely rebuilt after the end of the Civil War. From, you know, but they were taking people to Sandhurst, the British Military Academy, following their careers through. They had teams embedded in the Ministry of Defence, you know, colonels or, or you know, majors for years at a time, embedded there. So they had this long-standing relationship, looking not at we just want to look at your ability to, you know, buy guns. We just want to uh, try to drive trucks. They were saying, how do we look at the uh, armed forces as, a, as an institution as a whole and look at building you over 20 years? What we don't say is, how do we look at the health system as a whole and look over buildings? We, we take pieces. And um, the other thing I'll just say is we've definitely seen a boom in research funding uh, in global health. And in Britain right now, we are, we are overwhelmed at King's because every week there's a new five to 10 million pound grants, there's 50 of them every few weeks for global health, it's overwhelming. I think some of that's for good reason, as a recognition that, you know, there's so much we didn't know to inform programming. But I also think that in the UK at least, the British government made a commitment to spending 0.7% of GDP on aid, and it stuck to that commitment, but it's trying to find how to spend as much of that money as possible in the UK. And one way of doing that is to divert aid money to spend on British universities to hire people like me in London, rather than actually, Handing it over to partners in the Syria, you know, in the government in Syria and so forth. So I think there's good and bad reasons why there is so much global health research funding. But it's definitely the case right now that it's easier to win global health research grants, we find, than development grants. And there's an opportunity to be smart in. But I think one of the things we're struggling with is how do we meaningfully build capacity through a research grant? And how do we not kind of rob Peter to pay Paul or whatever in this fact as you say that there's a small number of partners out there who are getting a bit overwhelmed yes. you know um, and how do we how do we kind of do this in a in a meaningful way and how do we how what does Sierra Leone leadership of these grants look like in practice um, and so yeah I think it's key yeah and I think that's a big theme how do we broaden that pool you know because we're eager and want to be sensitive in our capacity building I think all of us do but there have to be other initiatives that are also funded to increase the pool yeah, um, because people are overwhelmed. Uh, the bright, dynamic people in Sierra Leone, and there are some really amazing people. They have, they're wearing too many hats, and I, I worry about them. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Uh, there's so much to think about. Uh, it's incredible. Um, I have a, a question that's related to systems, right? I think, you know, it, it's fascinating to hear um, how unprepared larger systems are, right? Both on the ground because of corruption, because of the way they were designed, and international systems to really address an epidemic that spreads like fire. The systems, by their nature, are slow. The bigger they are, the slower they are. Um, but what was also fascinating uh, is your note, uh, Oliver, about how people stepped up. Mm. Your filmmaker colleague, uh, the Sierra Leonean uh, expat, um, and so I'm interested in your thoughts about the extent to which uh, we might be able to use um, I don't know I want to say more modern uh, ways that humans come together, which is crowdsourcing, crowdfunding. Mm. There are all these people out there. Um, who just get together, uh, what's the American idiom on the chickpea or something like that? Um, and so you noted also, Oliver, how difficult it was to actually get the right funding in the right place, mm. right? But there are, there are so many people out there, they're going to give $5. Mm. You know, I think that was a real missed opportunity, um, you know, when you think about some of the the needs in the early days and these the small sort of flexible uh, money that was needed um, now you know 
<laughs> it's only now that I can look back and see, oh yes, you know, that would have been really useful. I think though there is a bit of a caveat, um, and I'll, you know, Oliver and I, we, we, we often have this conversation when we're sort of talking about the kind of leadership and the, you know, the, the, the lesson around the role of individuals, and that's that, you know, it's also very easy to undermine systems by over focusing on you know this individual and that individual and so basically the way Ebola was a very unusual uh, response you know and, and I think you know if you look at what happened with the tsunami you had an enormous amount of individual sort of uh, uh, you know philanthropy and you know enthusiasm to help and so on and that often really did not work out very well because people had no idea what they were doing and people didn't coordinate and 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 so you know there's a reason why we have a humanitarian system that has spent decades trying to you know sort out its coordination structure one of the problems we had was that that system didn't kick in in ebola because it was who's turf and Ebola had never been a humanitarian emergency before. It had only been these sort of isolated health crises. And so I do, I, I will sort of put that caveat that, you know, we, we also shouldn't, yes, we should find ways to engage uh, individuals. And I think, I think the crowdfunding thing it is, a, is a pretty harmless way of doing that. But we also have to remember how important, um, you know, how important it is to, to work through, um, you know, organizations that have, um, experience that have the right mandate to do something to avoid the sort of too many cooks uh, idea, but also this understanding of context. And I think this was one of the big issues with all the sort of tsunami volunteerism was, you know, people sort of just rocking up <laughs> Indonesia and not knowing anything about the context, but then doing something which, as we know, can also be quite harmful. So how you kind of walk that line between, and, and that's why, you know, we tend to say in the book, you know, individuals were able to play an extraordinary role, but they also needed to know when to step back. And the same thing applied to us as well, you know, because we could also become, uh, you know, you know, certainly people like me who were in this sort of, you know, kind of very unusual uh, role in the, in the response as, a, as an ambassador, you know, it just didn't, it wasn't the way it, it, it was supposed to be, but it was sort of forced by circumstances. But at the same time, when the response actually started to function properly, I had to change my role and take a step back. And then my role became more about helping to improve the new system rather than, you know, trying to kind of, you know, be always raising the alarm and this, that, and the other, because it actually wastes a lot of time. So, so it's, a, it's a difficult line to walk, but you're right. Uh, and I think on, on crowdfunding is, is an area that probably could have played a, a much bigger um, part in the response than it actually did. But it's also, it's just walking that line carefully, um, you know, with individuals, you know, not end up ending up doing more harm than good, but finding a way somehow to, to, to sort of, um, you know, maximize the potential of, of people's goodwill. Yeah, no, I, just, I think there's two ways when we talk about what lessons do we need to learn. One is, uh, have we learned the lesson about Ebola, dealing with an Ebola outbreak? And that's actually a fairly straightforward question. And not, I don't think, the more interesting one. For me, the more interesting question is, have we learned, are we better now at handling something completely unprecedented and unexpected that we didn't see coming? And that's the other question. And I think people have focused too much on the ideal Ebola response and not enough on, can our system handle a new stress? And I think there's certain things organizationally that we need to be better at putting in place to prepare for that. So one of which is trusting your people in the field. And there was way too much people at headquarters in DC or in London, you know, uh, when Kerrytown was open, say the children had all, all sorts of problems on the ground. And every time I said, you're wearing the wrong mask. And they'd say, I need to go to a committee in London to change our mask. So that, that, that chain, you know, and these people were not in the field, they didn't know. So trusting people in the field is one thing organizationally we need to put in place. Uh, another one is to say is flexible funding. Um, it was actually ultimately the most successful fundraising campaign King's has ever had was around our Ebola response uh, as a single campaign. Uh, and I've just finished this 10 year strategy for the King's partnerships. And in it, we set clear targets for the balance of funding that we have. And we've made very clearly, well, 10% of our funding to be small donations, fundraising that are completely flexible. And we're gonna commit ourselves to that so that, because what is a partnership really if our Sierra Leonean colleagues can't knock on the door or us in office in Connaught and say, we've got a new challenge today. Can you partner with us tomorrow to help us tackle it? And saying, well, we could put a grant together and maybe in 18 months it will come through. It, 
you know, in the realities of that does not enable a meaningful partnership. So I think funding is another part of it. A, a third one is, um, what is our appetite for risk? And deal, so there's a bit around, can we handle uncertainty? Can we deal organizationally with the fact that we don't know? And a lot of people said, we don't know, so let's pull out. And when we do know, we'll go back in. But the reality is the only way you're gonna know is by living it and finding out, and that's partly that trust issue. So we've got to be able to deal with uncertainty and be comfortable with uncertainty. Um, but this final point around, um, uh, what's that one said? Risk. Yeah, risk. Sorry. So uh, it, interestingly, during the Ebola response, I remember going back to King's and I said, look, we as a King's team are going, one of us is going to get infected. It'll be me or it'll be Marshall or someone else. But there's the realities of that time. One of us will get infected. Probably at the time, one of us will die. And when that happens, I said, King's has got to not pull out because you knew this risk was there. So you can't suddenly pretend when one of us gets sick that this is a big shock and we're going to evacuate our team and, and our colleagues. You've got to be in this and comfortable with that risk. And to my astonishment, and actually the Vice Chancellor now denies he ever said this, but it's in an email, that they said, okay, like, we understand this and we're committed to it. By comparison, the British Army asked the British ambassador, or well, they asked colleagues there, what, what, is the, um, what is the acceptable casualty rate for the British Army's response in Sierra Leone? And the response came back to zero. It is unacceptable to have any British Army casualties. So they're in a strange situation where a British university has accepted a level of risk that the British Army won't accept. And we were in a, a meeting uh, on Monday last week where someone said, but of course, the US military had no capacity to respond to a medical outbreak. And I think you're saying the US military had more capacity than like, me and Marta to respond to an outbreak. So there's also a how much do we care question within this so that when things come up, that speaks to flexibility. If, you want, if the system wants something to happen, it'll make it happen. Uh, one way or another, and, and yes, I think so. And then that. you know that very few of how uh, one of the global organizations um, is more concerned about it coming to the Western world than about what is happening there. But you can always count on that, you know, so. And, and you can use that too. Yes. And we did sometimes, yes. uh, you know, yes. so we tried to, <laughs> you know, yeah, we, we tried to use that as, as a way to mobilize. Um, mobilize support because we had to accept that that was the reality. Yeah, and one more thing. Wait, 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 no, guys, can we just see if there's online? Is anyone in Sierra Leone or Liberia wanting just to? Guys, uh, just a comment. We do have, yeah, thank you, which I can read if I can, if I can read it from here. It says, please thank you. Please thank them so much. Do you want me to read it? Yes, okay. could you care? <laughs> <laughs> please thank them so much for me. I have a class in 10 minutes, but it was so nice to learn a little bit more about the crisis and how it was handled. My vaccine development and public health class is covering Ebola right now, and a professor often talks about both cultural competency and handling crises and the importance of infrastructure. So it was interesting to hear Dr. Walsh's and Dr. Johnson's uh, viewpoints on this. And just to mention one of the things we've said before is, you know, so an organization like CDC came in with some fantastically qualified epidemiologists, PhDs, great to work with, very professional, but they then hit the realities of politics on the ground and dealing with politics. And one of the things they observed, one thing said to them is, it's not just enough to be technically excellent. You've got to be able to translate that into A, being very practical, and B, being able to handle and navigate through the politics. And that's got to be part of how we're preparing people. Because otherwise, all technicals, it's technical is 20%. 80% is the practical and the political. But I mean, they also were on four week terms, which is, which is, um, which was a, because of a broader US government rule. And, and, and that's, I mean, that's a much wider issue for the international community as a whole. Our turnover, I mean, not just in humanitarian context, but also even in development context. When we have some people coming to, to South Sudan, uh, you know, uh, in, in the US embassy working on sort of political issues on one year terms. And I'm thinking to myself, how does that? How does that work? You know, and I know, you know, I know, I know why. I know we all in our systems have difficulty, uh, you know, recruiting people for places like uh, Juba. But, but uh, you know, really uh, to understand the context and to have any chance of sort of dealing with all these politics and everything, you know, we just need to be around for much longer. And on that point, could you say more about when you said uh, engaging the community? and how that went badly, and that was one of the big lessons learned. What would that have looked like had it been done well? And are there examples of other responses now that are doing a better job on that? Well, actually, Liberia did, uh, ultimately did a much better job than Sierra Leone. And, and, but they actually started off in exactly the same way, which was very punitive. You know, if there's a case there, lock everybody up. And that was our policy. That was the Sierra Leone policy for the entire response. 
if 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 you come to my house and, and I'm a suspect case, I go to the clinic, my entire household then will be locked up for 21 days to wait and see if anybody else is a suspect case, thereby increasing the risk, by the way, that people will be suspect cases because they're locked up in this small space with others who might also be infected, but also the psychological impact that that had on people. So of course you have people escape, you have people flee, you know. Uh, uh, so so we, we took this very punitive approach and Liberia took the punitive approach in the beginning. They actually locked up an entire slum uh, in Monrovia on uh, West Point, you know, 250,000 people surrounded by, uh, you know, policemen and, and all the, the gear. Um, and after 10, there was a complete disaster. And after 10 days, the president said, okay, I was wrong. You know, and, and, and totally changed then the, the, uh, the approach to community engagement and made it much more about, you know, and again, what we always had wanted and not achieved in Sierra Leone, uh, ownership. You know, saying to people, okay, look, we can come and tell you the facts about this disease. We can come and tell you the medical stuff, whatever. But then you need to tell us how you, in your very particular set of circumstances, can actually, you know, fight this and then we'll help you fight it. Whereas we used to come in and just, you know, give people, um, you know, these instructions, many of which were ludicrous. Like, mother, you know, your child is vomiting. Don't touch your child. I mean, really? Like, would we say that to an American woman? You know, would we say that to a woman in Massachusetts, your child is vomiting, but obviously don't touch your child. And we think this is a reasonable thing to say to you. Whereas what we should have been saying was, you know, how can we, you know, and, and it's, there's no easy solutions when we were so overwhelmed, but how can we, you know, try to support, um, you know, people to actually, and then, then they will start also trusting their response. And then when you trust the response, then we can actually come up with, you know, some, some more, uh, you know, creative ways to do things. And you did have, you did, you did ultimately in Sierra Leone, and we had some anthropologists helping out with this as well. And ultimately you were able to find some, some kind of compromises you know, around like burials, for example, you know, this was one of the most difficult things for, for communities to handle was these sanitized burials and, you know, the person would just be kind of, you know, in this plastic bag and they would be taken off and never see them again. We eventually moved to a situation where, yes, it was a sanitized burial, but the family could be there, but they had to be 10 feet away from the grave. But, you know, it wasn't great, but it was better. And, and people, you know, people, because they had been, you know, oriented well they understood actually this is to protect me but it took us it took us way too long to get there but but definitely Liberia they they got there sooner and there's some good examples from it. Thank you both so much we're gonna have to wrap up it's been amazing anyone who can get their time before they have to take off they're giving five talks today. We want to thank you so much.